It was a glorious morning, late spring or early summer, as you care to take it, when the dainty sheen of grass and leaf is blushing to a deeper green, and the year seems like a fair young maid, trembling with strange, wakening pulses on the brink of womanhood. The sun had got more powerful by the time we'd finished breakfast, and the wind had dropped, and it was as lovely a morning as one could desire. We drew up and lunched. We tackled the cold beef for lunch, and then we found that we'd forgotten to bring any mustard. I don't think I ever, in my life, before or since, felt I wanted mustard as badly as I felt I wanted it then. I don't care for mustard as a rule, and it's very seldom that I take it at all, but I would have given worlds for it then. It cast a gloom over the boat, there being no mustard. We ate our beef in silence. Existence seemed hollow and uninteresting. Until well the other side of Henley, it is somewhat bare and dull. For myself, I'm fond of locks. They pleasantly break the monotony of the pull. I like sitting in the boat and slowly rising out of the cool depths up into new reaches and fresh views, or sinking down, as it were, out of the world and then waiting while the gloomy gates creak and the narrow strip of daylight between them widens till the fair, smiling river lies full before you, and you push your little boat out from its brief prison on to the welcoming waters once again. Marlow is one of the pleasantest river centres I know of. It is a bustling, lively little town. We pulled up in the backwater just below Cookham, and dropped into a very pleasant nook under a great elm tree, to the spreading roots of which we fastened the boat. Then we thought we were going to have supper. We dispensed with tea so as to save time. But George said, no, that we'd better get the canvas up first before it got quite dark. That canvas wanted more putting up than I think any of us had bargained for. It looked so simple in the abstract. You took five iron arches, like gigantic croquet hoops, and fitted them up over the boat, and then stretched the canvas over them and fastened it down. It would take quite ten minutes, we thought. That was an underestimate. We took up the hoops and began to drop them into the sockets placed for them. First, they would not fit into their sockets at all, and we had to jump on them and kick them and hammer at them with the boat hook. And when they were in, it turned out that they were the wrong hoops for those particular sockets, and they had to come out again. But they would not come out until two of us had gone and struggled with them for five minutes, when they would jump up suddenly and try and throw us into the water and drown us. They had hinges in the middle, and when we were not looking, they nipped us with these hinges in delicate parts of the body. And while we were wrestling with one side of the hoop and endeavouring to persuade it to do its duty, the other side would come up behind us in a cowardly manner and hit us over the head. We got them fixed at last, and then all that was to be done was to arrange the covering over them. George unrolled it and fastened one end over the nose of the boat. Harris stood in the middle to take it from George and roll it on to me, and I kept by the stern to receive it. It was a long time coming down to me. George did his part all right, but it was new work to Harris, and he bungled it. We could see the canvas being violently jerked and tossed about pretty considerably, but we supposed this was part of the method and did not interfere. It took us an hour's hard labour before it was properly up. We woke late the next morning and partook of a plain breakfast. Then we cleaned up and put everything straight. It seemed to me that I was doing more than my fair share of the work on this trip, and I was beginning to feel strongly on the subject. It always does seem to me that I'm doing more work than I should do. It's not that I object to the work. Mind you, I like work. It fascinates me. I can sit and look at it for hours. In a boat, I have always noticed that it is the fixed idea of each member of the crew that he is doing everything. Harris's notion was that it was he alone who'd been working and that both George and I had been imposing upon him. George, on the other hand, ridiculed the idea of Harris's having done anything more than eat and sleep and had a cast-iron opinion that it was he, George himself, who had done all the labour worth speaking of. He said he'd never been out with such a couple of lazy skulks as Harris and I. Huh, that amused Harris. 
Montmorency was in it all, of course. Montmorency's ambition in life is to get in the way and be sworn at. If he can squirm in anywhere where he particularly is not wanted and be a perfect nuisance and make people mad and have things thrown at his head, then he feels his day has not been wasted. We passed through Ifley Lock at about half past twelve and then, having tidied up the boat and made all ready for landing, we set to work on our last mile. In silence, we dragged out and overhauled the Gladstone. We looked up the river and down the river. Not a soul was in sight. Twenty minutes later, three figures, followed by a shamed-looking dog, might have been seen creeping stealthily away from the boathouse at the Swan, towards the railway station, dressed in the following neither neat nor gaudy costume. Black leather shoes, dirty, Suit of boating flannels, very dirty. Brown felt hat, much battered. Mackintosh, very wet. Umbrella. Well, said Harris, reaching his hand out for his glass, we've had a pleasant trip, and my hearty thanks for it to old Father Thames. But I think we did well to chuck it when we did. Here's to three men well out of a boat. And Montmorency... Standing on his hind legs before the window, peering out into the night, gave a short bark of decided concurrence with the toast. <laughs>